It's nearly Halloween, and that means it's time to discuss a spooky spectre. Well, not technically a spectre. Today we're doing a deep dive on the ghost in D&D. Because I believe, if run optimally, the CR4 ghost is such an unstoppable monster that being haunted by one is almost literally a death sentence. You may at this point be thinking, Tom, you've gone off the deep end. Sure, ghosts are, you know, a reasonably threatening mid to low CR monster. They're a pain to fight and they have resistances and immunities galore. But I'm here to tell you that perception is only just scratching the surface. Today, we're going to look at what a motivated, a truly motivated ghost can do mechanically and look at what we can do as storytellers to inspire that great fear, that threat, and to use that mechanical new knowledge in a law-friendly and narratively fascinating way. So let's dive into the ghost. First off, it has a rather pitiful armor class of 11 and also slightly lacking average hit points of just 45. It has a 40 foot fly speed, but it can hover, which it should be doing at all times because hovering is better than flying, even despite the fact that the ghost is immune to being grappled, exhausted, prone, paralyzed, and restrained, basically meaning it's very unlikely for this to ever come up, for it to ever have to try not to fall out of the sky. They are also difficult to damage, impossible if you're using cold damage, necrotic damage, or poison damage, and are unaffected by most conditions. They have dark vision and ethereal sight as well, up to 60 feet, and know all of the languages they knew when they were alive. They can also move through objects and people, although they will take some force damage if they end their turn inside an object. Not technically inside a person, though. We'll cover that later, because you can't officially end a turn in another creature's space. Perhaps unless you're in the different plane to them. Now, onto the good stuff. Their attacks deal an average of 17 points of damage, which is potent. But the last three abilities on their stat block are really the big ones. The first, they can use an action to switch from occupying the ethereal to the material plane, and vice versa. They are always visible on both planes, but are only able to affect other creatures and objects or be affected by other creatures and objects on the same plane that they inhabit at that present moment. Specifically, they can't affect or be affected by anything on the other plane. This will become important later. Next, we have Horrifying Visage, which causes any non-undead to make a mid to low DC wisdom save, or be frightened. If they get an 8 or below, however, they age either 10, 20, 30, or 40 years. A success renders a creature immune to this effect for 24 hours, which is the exact amount of time that an affected creature has to get this fixed via greater restoration or it becomes permanent. Bear in mind the simple fact that some creatures just don't live that long. If horrifying visage is used on a squirrel, it's going to die if it fails that saving throw. It, it can really be a save or die ability. And even if you are going to survive, 24 hours is not a long time to find a an at least ninth level spellcaster with that particular spell prepared and a free fifth level spell slot. Lastly, the ghost can attempt to possess a humanoid it can see within five feet. On a failed DC 13 charisma save, the ghost disappears, meaning incidentally it cannot use its horrifying visage as no creature will be able to see it. But crucially, it takes full control of the target's body. While in this form, it can basically only be affected by uh, turn effects and spells that specifically expel uh, possession, nothing else. It keeps its mental stats, alignment, and immunity to uh, charmed and frightened conditions, but doesn't get the target's class features, knowledge, or proficiencies. The possession lasts until the creature the ghost is inhabiting hits zero hit points, the ghost is forced out by a spell like protection from good and evil, or the ghost chooses to end the possession early using a bonus action also important. On a successful save or after a possession ends, the target is immune to that effect for 24 hours. 
And that's basically all of the meaningful mechanics, except for the, the undead nature of the thing, meaning it doesn't need to eat, sleep, drink, or breathe. If it did have a motivation, a requirement for sustenance, the ghost might possibly be the greatest persistence hunter of all time. First things first, they're just fast. A 40-foot fly speed is, is nothing to sniff at. A ghost can track most creatures flawlessly with some extra movement to spare. Furthermore, don't imagine you can evade it with some locked door, secret bunker, or something else, as they can simply phase through walls at will. And they can also see through walls up to 60 feet as well. But fine, surely if a ghost is stalking you, there are ways to get rid of it. Surely a, a cleric of sufficient level can destroy undead on a failed save using their channel of divinity. And if they're not powerful enough to destroy them straight up, they can scare them away with turn undead. To destroy a ghost completely though, you're going to need a 17th level cleric's destroy undead feature. And if you turn it, Yes, it's turned for a minute, but that's just one minute. A ghost can haunt you 24 hours of the day. Fine, just attack the damn thing. Well, there's no way of actually knowing if it's even able to take damage at any given moment. After all, a ghost is equally visible on the material plane, whether it is inhabiting the material or ethereal plane. And on the ethereal plane, it cannot be affected by anything originating on the material. And there's going to be no visual indication as to whether the ghost is tangible or intangible until you actually try and affect it. Perhaps a kind GM might uh, add some description or some flavour or uh, allow there to be a, a visual cue for the ghost's transition of plane to plane. But seeing as the ghost is equally visible no matter which plane it's on, there's not a visual cue implied by the rules. And even if there is, it's unlikely to be obvious. And now the true horror begins to show itself. In the ghost, we have a creature that doesn't need to rest, cannot be exhausted, is fast enough to hunt most people down, even including walls and cover, castles and fortresses, where even if you can see the creature, it is a pure guessing game as to whether it can be affected by arrows, swords, or literally anything. So now we're going to look at a few scenarios. 1. A regular guy being haunted by a vengeful spirit. 2. A trained combatant with the means to kill a CR4 enemy who's being hunted by a vengeful spirit. And 3. The richest guy in the city with all the world's resources at his beck and call being haunted by a vengeful spirit. The first guy stands no chance. The ghost is faster than him. He is basically not threatening to it. So it hunts him until he is alone, just while it's ethereal, recorporates, and then kills him. Best case scenario, this guy gets to a temple with some uh, powerful spellcasting uh, devotees of a god. Hopefully enough magic to cast something like Magic Circle. If the ghost is persistent and motivated enough, this gentleman is going to be living inside a temple, inside a magic circle, for the rest of his life. Still having to be totally vigilant, by the way, just in case the ghost manages to possess one of the priests attending to him, uh, either poisoning his food or gathering a ranged weapon and just taking him out inside the magic circle. Anyway. In the absolute best case scenario, the temple will already have something like a forbiddance to keep undead out. And so our little fellow can change from hiding inside a magic circle to hiding inside a temple. Just a temple for the rest of his entire life. This is an amazing origin story for a monk, by the way. Trapped inside a temple by a vengeful spirit who can't get in, forced to follow the uh, way of the monastic order that inhabits it, and eventually training so much so that he becomes capable of going toe-to-toe -to -toe with a ghost and escaping his chains. Most likely, though, our gentleman cannot find sanctuary in time. And sanctuary itself it is a really fascinating concept from history, which... I do need to get into a video on at some point in the future. But most likely, they will be killed in the street before even a guardsman's weapon can be drawn. And the ghost will be ethereal once more. The second individual, then. A, a person capable of taking on a ghost in a fair fight. But why would the ghost give them that? 
Arrogance may play a part here and stop this individual from seeking out a temple, seeking out a salvific place to hide out for the rest of his life. Our warrior may choose to wait for the ghost to strike, or leave its ethereal haunt, become corporeal, and take that moment to act. Perhaps they hold an attack or hold a spell um, to wait for seeing that strange shimmer that happens when the ghost stops being ethereal and starts being corporeal. Although they can't hold a, a leveled spell because that would exhaust spell slots almost immediately if they're doing it for, you know, any longer than a few seconds. But what if the ghost just waits? Well, holding an action requires little effort, so it can kind of correlate with some forms of resting. So our individual rests then, waiting for the ghost to materialise so they can take advantage of that brief window. By the rules, you can take rests while doing nothing, or even you can take a short rest while keeping watch. So our individual can constantly be short resting, recuperating, ready to strike. But what's a short rest actually good for? After all, everyone needs a long rest every so often, or they start making progressively more difficult constitution saving throws or taking levels of exhaustion. And according to the new 2024 exhaustion rules, those subsequent exhaustion checks, if you keep not sleeping for days on end, become more difficult as you gain levels of exhaustion, which kind of has a, a, a vicious cycle to it. After five levels of exhaustion, you're looking at a minus 10 penalty to any d20 roll, including con saves to avoid further exhaustion. Okay, but creatures like elves don't need to sleep during a long rest. Surely, if our warrior is an elf, they can keep vigilant the entire time they rest, meaning they can get a full long rest, essentially refreshing that exhaustion timer, while keeping watch and making sure that the ghost doesn't do anything uh, sneaky. Well, unfortunately, during a long rest, the maximum amount of light activity you can uh, use is just two hours. And any interruption to your rest, such as rolling initiative, taking damage, or casting a leveled spell, causes an additional hour to be added on to the time that you need to fulfil the requirements of a long rest. Once you restart it, of course. This is the true goal of a ghost's persistence. Can it cause enough disruption to a person's mental state and, indeed, their sleep, requiring them to be constantly vigilant, to stop them from taking a long rest? every 24 hours. My opinion is, yes, absolutely. Sleep renders a person unconscious, meaning they are incapacitated, prone, and crucially, drop whatever they are holding. Attack rolls against them have advantage, and attack rolls within, from within five feet are automatic critical hits. To put the cherry on top, if they do fall asleep, they also become unaware of their surroundings. The only strategic option is to stay awake, hope someone helps you, or find help yourself, and hope that there's someone powerful enough to deal with a ghost on your behalf, or, or with you at least. Because let's actually play it out. What if someone does try to catch 40 winks while being haunted and hunted? Initiative gets rolled, unwillingly by the sleeping character, as the ghost becomes unethereal with an intent to harm them. It moves up silently to the sleeping person using its hover. By the way, the sleeper had disadvantage on their initiative roll because they're incapacitated and they can take no actions or reactions or anything like that. Next turn, the ghost attacks with advantage and if it hits, scores a critical hit. If it misses, well, it just tries again. As they've taken no damage, there's no reason that they would wake up. So assuming damage eventually gets done, the sleeper immediately stops being unconscious and stops being incapacitated, but does not lose the prone condition. And they've also dropped anything they're holding as per the rules of unconsciousness, meaning that any attempt at an opportunity attack that might come in the next, you know, now, will be made with an unarmed strike instead, which will not deal significant damage, even if they've specked into that sort of thing. And seeing as the ghost's intention after swiping at the unconscious creature is to immediately move away, provoking an attack of opportunity if they choose to take it with an unarmed strike because they haven't had time to pick anything up because it hasn't been their turn yet, well, the ghost is going to be pretty unharmed by this and move back 40 feet, hopefully, um, either 
up through the ceiling to make it completely impossible to hurt it, or behind a nearby wall. Again, making it impossible to target the creature with an attack on the individual's turn. That opportunity attack, likely just one point of damage. And even if you can do more, unless your attacks are magical, the ghost is taking half of that damage due to its resistances to non-magical bludgeoning damage. In contrast, the ghost does an average of 31 necrotic damage by attacking a sleeping target and getting that auto crit. And then it disappears, hopefully, behind some solid object that makes it unable to be targeted by the sleeping, the ex-sleeping person. It's our warrior's turn. If the ghost is out of range of any weapons they have to hand, or is past an impassable barrier, they're out of luck. If not, they have one round to harm a creature that is 40 feet away while they're starting from prone with no weapons, before that creature, as its action on the next turn, will turn ethereal again, making it unable to be harmed. And bear in mind, the ghost still resists non-magical damage, and even in the worst case scenario where they, the person has picked an open field to sleep in, the ghost can still sit just in the ground, taking a, a small amount of force damage, as opposed to being the target of, say, an action surge, a whole bunch of attacks. It can just sit waiting in the ground instead. It can remain inside an object, making it unable to be harmed by the person and taking the negligible force damage that that, pen that penalises it. So with our little scenario played out, that is two interruptions to sleep. So two mandatory extra hours of long rest on top of the regular resting time. Rinse and repeat on random intervals throughout the rest. And frankly, the target will never sleep again. And that's if it can survive multiple instances of 31 necrotic damage. Even with short rest, your hit dice are going to be depleted very, very quickly. Best part is, for each level of exhaustion they take in trying to get away from this creature and, and failing to sleep, their attacks and saving throws just get worse and worse. Meaning that relatively low DC 13 charisma save against possession gets harder and harder. And if you fail that, then there is literally nothing in the rules that stops a ghost from bashing your own head against a wall until you hit zero hit points. Go unconscious, then the possession ends, and a few quick swipes will finish you off. No death saves required. If you're ever possessed while alone and aren't, you know, a half-orc or something else that can recover from zero hit points uh, naturally, it's a death sentence being possessed. There's no subsequent saves against possession, even when the creature takes damage. And the best part? Because possession can be ended as a bonus action by the ghost, even if reinforcements arrive and look like they're going to overwhelm the ghost the moment it, 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 uh, it finishes off its possessed target, well, the ghost still has the chance to use its bonus action at the start of its turn to end the possession, and then its action on the turn to swap directly into the ethereal plane, meaning it can exit the body and exit the ability to, for anything to hurt it in the throes of its own turn. So what can actually theoretically be done about a ghostly haunting if it is motivated enough? Well, let's look at our last potential victim, the rich guy. Having a set of hired guards throughout to keep watch throughout a sleeping period is, is a very good idea, generally, especially as after the ghost becomes unethereal, it is technically vulnerable in that moment if you're paying enough attention and able to use your action to just launch things into it. Assuming, of course, that this transition from the ethereal to the material plane is even noticeable, you'd ideally want some guards that are trained in noticing the signs of a subtle dimensional shift on the ghost's part. But if your guards are then going to shout out to alert the rest of the camp that this has happened, well, you're going to be losing sleep that way as well. Additionally, armed guards are indeed at risk of possession, so you'd want at least two on watch at all times to monitor each other and make sure that they're not uh, the recipients of a ghostly possession. And of course, you want to be in a place with sight lines beyond 40 feet and as few objects and obstacles as possible for the ghost to get behind. One thing a ghost could do to install massive paranoia is, especially if guards are beefed up against uh, these, these things through protection spells, the ghost can still 
try to end its turn inside a guardman's body. The rules specifically state that you can't end your turn inside another creature's space, but I would argue that the ethereal plane and the material plane are two different spaces, per se. So if the visible ghost ends its turn inside a creature's space, but being on the ethereal plane and the creature being on the material, it would look very much like a successful possession, causing an alarm, causing panic and causing potentially the two guardsmen to start, start firing at each other, assuming possession has happened to either one of them, while the ghost is safe and sound in the plane where it cannot be hurt. Our rich fellow is probably still served by some form of magical protection, like a magic circle, or a forbiddance made permanent against the undead, perhaps on his uh, massive estate the forbiddance takes place and keeps the ghost out so he can actually have some safe rest. But this still requires any trip outside his own mansion to have a competent armed personal escort, even to the toilet, unless they can afford to have the firepower to take out a ghost on the moments of its appearing, or a sufficiently high level cleric to just rip the thing out of existence. A dedicated ghostly haunting just regardless of wealth, uh, power, and, and all things like that, is a, an incredibly mentally draining effort, exhausting effort, which is life-ruining, or life-altering at least, paranoia-inducing, and if you have no friends, family, allies, or, or money to pay for those things, it is really a death sentence. Unless you can find a really seriously powerful spellcaster, or a group of sufficiently potent adventurers, perhaps. Ghosts are essentially perfect assassins, and they also have another added benefit, which is that everyone around you who can see the ghost looming over you, waiting, for it to, it, waiting to take its chance, knows that you are marked for death. So how do we actually use this mechanically terrifying foe in a lore-appropriate sense? Well, unfortunately, as per the law of D&D and, and, and 5th edition as well, ghosts are tragically limited. They haunt a location, an object, or a person, and tend to be a hyper-localised phenomenon. This will then stop them from roaming across an entire city, haunting a new target to death every week. Right? Haunting a certain location really does mean that if no one chooses to go there, it's just a haunted house on the edge of town, and only those who would risk the, well, the frankly idiotic step of stepping into a haunted home in, in a D&D world where haunting is very much real and deadly would pay the price. Murderers may seek to do all of their killings in, in abandoned barns, fields, or such like, on the very edge of civilization, just to make sure that if a ghost is created, well, they can be right back home to their regular haunts while the creature haunts a certain location far, far away. Criminal gangs may ship their victims out of their territory first, just to limit any spectral interference in their affairs. But if a ghost is tied to haunting a specific object or a specific person, well, then that all changes, because they can move. Ghosts disappear when the purpose of their unfinished business is fulfilled. What if that unfinished business is the dismantling of a crime family? The ghost's treasured locket with a picture of their wife taken from them as the last repossession of a debt that the destitution of which absolutely killed them. Well, they may systematically stalk and hunt the criminal enterprise to death through exhaustion, strikes, critical strikes while sleeping, or self-inflicted damage from successful possessions, with perhaps an extra twist of irony for, uh, say, a haunting visage, aging the aged crime boss lord, um, to a point where he is decrepit and on death's door. If a ghost was attempting to dismantle a government, crime family, company, or alliance of lords in life, and gets interrupted on their way to doing that, well, their spirit is likely to be far more dangerous than whatever they could do as a real person. Political assassinations, therefore, become a double-edged sword. How do you absolutely ensure that there is no risk of ghostly vengeance on you if you assassinate a political opponent? Perhaps you have to hire an outside company to do your dirty work, 
Or maybe this is why we see things that were invented uh, as compassions for people who were facing capital punishment, like last rites, last meals, and things of that description. Maybe that's why we see them, instead of Christian compassion, in, say, a fantasy world. Perhaps it is all to limit the possibility of the creation of a, a nigh-unkillable ghostly avenger. Maybe there's an order of death clerics who have certain specific rituals who become the go-to bringers of assassination-style death in a world because they know exactly how to avoid making ghosts when they kill people. Or perhaps a clever organisation will ha arrange for their rival's biggest detractor to be murdered, disguising their operatives as their rivals, right down to the distinctive snake tattoos, perhaps, in hopes of creating a spectre of vengeance to go against their own enemies, their mutual enemy, perhaps, uh, by virtue of a simple trick and a simple murder of a too curious investigative reporter. The best way to exploit this, though, is in getting to the ghost before they become a ghost. Indoctrinating a person, either through enchantment magic, modify memory specifically, or just simple coercion, might be able to give them a life's purpose which is theoretically unfinishable, allowing you to use their ghost as a weapon to finish or attempt to finish that life's purpose, constantly introducing new obstacles, new changing the goalposts slightly in what you need to do, just so we can have that peaceful world that we were all looking for, even when you were alive, my dearest friend. Because ghosts can communicate in any language they knew in life. They don't have a specifically fixed evil alignment or anything. They can be of any alignment, even seeking restorative justice, potentially. They tend towards how they behaved in life because they finished their unfinished business. That's the goal, at least. As an example, then, if you trained a person to detest kobolds with the very fibre of their being, believing them to be murderous scum with a goal in life of eliminating every last one, developing some sort of, you know, super xenophobe, and then arranged for their untimely death, perhaps at a very well-paid hired kobold assassin's hand who doesn't well, he wouldn't need paying that much even, because this is the guy that hates kobolds, right? You immediately have a ghostly entity capable of hunting down any kobold they may wish to find. Toss that spectral locket uh, that they inhabit down a sewer, and voila. Just be careful that the ghost doesn't know that you were behind arranging its death. Obviously. This process could reasonably be used for any identifiable group. A gang, group of town guards, an entire monarchic structure. Especially if you have the power to uh, use modify memory judiciously to shape the narrative of their life. Although, I must say, it has to be used before the creature dies, because ghosts are immune to being charmed. And you also have the added benefit of knowing that this unfinished business that holds them in the world may never be completed. Because even if they manage to eliminate all of the cobbled, the entire monarchic structure, well, the actual unfinished business is the betrayal by one that called them friend, that taught them everything they needed to know, that gave them their world view, that helped them along the way. You, the one who arranged for their death in the first place. The one that stole its mind and will and turned it into an assassin. In terms of ghosts that haunt creatures, it is entirely possible that some evil necromancer or a lich or some other uh, nasty creature, some great undead perhaps, or a hag, has a lot of vengeful spirits out for blood. Perhaps these ghosts hang around this evil creature at all times, trying desperately to hurt them with any way they can. If this evil creature can find a way to be immune to necrotic damage, not really worry about aging, so being undead or something, and or have a roughly plus 12 to wisdom and charisma saves, well then the ghost can really do nothing to you. But imagine, say, a group of four or five people come to kill that evil entity, with the ghosts frustratedly circling around them in a maelstrom of misery. Well, it is very likely that the ghosts would want some personal revenge, so might try and take over the bodies, say, of these particular four to five uh, adventurous types. Unfortunately, though, 
a successful possession would mean that the ghost gets control of the body, able to fight and hurt the lich or whatever creature it is with a real sword for the, for the first time ever, as they can do things that aren't necrotic damage for the first time in centuries. The only problem is the ghosts wouldn't get access to class features and the most powerful spells and abilities that these bodies had walking into the room. And so may, unfortunately, weaken the party of adventurers come to do the ghosts' bidding for them, out of sheer frustration and want for personal vengeance. The ghosts would then become protectors, perhaps, or an extra obstacle used in the defensive forces of this particular terribly evil entity. The potential of the ghost, in my opinion, is endless, and not just as roleplay focused monsters that encourage or force your players to delve deeper into the lore of this particular character, their death or some social problem to find how to resolve their unfinished trauma. I hope I've proved today that played optimally, a ghost is legitimately terrifying for basically anyone and is perhaps the most effective assassination tool in a D&D world. Go forth and horrify your players with my Halloween gift to you. But with all that said, I've been Tom, otherwise known as the Grungeon Master. Thank you very much for watching and I will see you in the next video.